today we'll hear about using deep learning uh, on point clouds and how that can help um, manufacturing. So thank you and over to thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Ben Trowen. I, uh, <clears throat> in a past life, uh, used to run the reservoir lab out of Ghent University. Uh, I uh, turned to the dark side, and I'm now in industry. Uh, so I gave up my professor position. Uh, I first, I, I lived in Silicon Valley for a while. Uh, there, I co-founded Octon recently, and I actually moved back to uh, moved back to Europe. Um, the, the stock is slightly different. So first, we'll give a, some of, a bit of a brief introduction, of like what is the real problem with manufacturing and what are we trying to solve? And then Raphael will like, dive into details and explain uh, to some depth how we specifically solve one of the really difficult problems in manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> So manufacturing is about a $1 trillion industry, which literally runs on Windows 95 software. It's horrible. Like it's all done with mental simulation. So people have to like type in magic numbers and then like simulate in their brains how the machines are then gonna turn it into real products. And it's all based on, on people that, have, that are highly uh, experienced in doing one specific thing, which takes them like a decade to gain that experience. Um, and the big problem there is actually that that is becoming an aging population. So it's not the people working in the factory, but the people designing the factories, programming the machines, are becoming an aging population. And there's not enough of them. That's like the dirty secret of manufacturing nowadays. Um, on the other hand, there is all these market drivers. We want more rapid time to market, smaller batches, mass customization. There's all these new processes, robots, 3D printers, composites, all these amazing new things we can do that are even more difficult to mentally simulate. Um, there is a very shifting workforce. Like young people don't want to like, do the same thing their whole career. Like they want to like, develop and like, learn new things. And so the shifting workforce doesn't doesn't really allow like these old ways of working anymore. And there is a very serious thought of deglobalization, um, of actually bringing manufacturing back and bringing that manufacturing expertise back. Uh, and so people want all this, but like live in this reality. It's a, it's a big, big problem. Um, and so typical software looks like this. So it's like a lot of buttons. <laughs> and they typically start with a blank canvas. So there's like nothing there. And you have to do everything. You are the expert. You're in control. You use this software daily for like a decade. Um, highly complicated. And so this is specifically if you want to metal 3D print. So one of our first, um, one of our first applications is actually metal 3D printing. So it's, people know 3D printers, but so 3D printers can also print metal. So here's an example of a dental implant, metal 3D printed. Um, people have to manually design it. Some of our customers have to do 2,000 of these a day. These are 2,000 files that come in. 2,000 times people have to use this shitty software to get it produced. It's mind blowing. Um, so yeah, I explained that. So this is the, uh, although people think, oh yeah, lean manufacturing, like st the software industry learns so much from, from manufacturing. All of manufacturing is waterfall, it's crazy. So it starts with design and an order, and then it's like you have to plan and prep and like write software how you're gonna drive the machines, and then you run the machines, and, and, and then you do inspection and put, like it's, Total waterfall. There's like different divisions in companies that do this with different software and there's no feedback. It's crazy. Um, so enter the Octon factory operating system. So Octon is a relatively young startup, like we're 18 months old. We're started actually by most of the senior manufacturing. So like there's a company Autodesk in, uh, in Silicon Valley that's known for their design software. Most of the senior leadership in the manufacturing side of the house there left and started Octon to really rethink that whole space. And our product is called FactoryOS for a reason. Like we want to power the future autonomous factories. Um, and so this is, uh, how we redraw the diagram. So like, like we want to create a vicious cycle where if you design something and then produce it and something goes wrong, you learn from it next time, you can make better decisions. And not just you as a human, but you can be, we capture all the data, we can then learn agents 
advisors that can help you make these decisions. So you don't have to start from scratch every time. So if you look at it, yeah, it's this interplay between like planning algorithms and simulation and like a lot of, uh, a lot of complexity on how we actually compute these things that will go to the factory. But the most important thing is like a connected ecosystem. Like we plan how we're gonna drive the machines and then we get data from the machines and we see what's, if it works, yes or, yes or no. It sounds so simple, in reality it doesn't happen yet. Um, it's kind of like, there's a lot of people working on self-driving cars. This is my cartoon explanation of what a self-driving car does. So there's like some high level decision making, planning, where am I going? Then there is like some sensing and perception from uh, whatever, like those that still use LiDAR. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's like some low level decision making and predictions based on the, that sensing that then leads into the high level decision making. And then there's like some nifty closed loop control. So this is kind of like simple block diagram of a self-driving car. This is how we think about a self-driving factory. It's exactly the same. So orders come in, like where do we want to go? What do we want to produce? Then there's like high level optimization of the plan. How are we going to do it with the equipment that's available, with the people that are available? We learn models that actually predict quality, manufacturability, cost from data we get from the real facility. And then we create all these optimization routines that from that data then suggest to the planner different ways of how something can be made. This is a $1 trillion industry with about like, I don't know, 100 companies competing. This is a trillion dollar industry with like nobody competing. Anyway, that, that was my five minute pitch. <laughs> so here's a very brief video of like how our product looks like. It's fully like cloud-based, runs in the browser on any device, cell phones, uh, laptops, old crappy computers. Uh, it does everything from order intake, managing the whole process, simulation, like preparing parts, running a schedule, driving the machines, IoT platform, it's all there. Everything, all connected. We get all the data for what our people doing, what our machines doing. We planned this, in reality it didn't work. That's where, that's where we're at today. Um, initially, we focused on a very specific industry for us to be able to focus the products. And so metal, dental, 3D printed parts, what I show you here. Um, this part was typically, if a human has to prepare this, spends about like half an hour for this part. This was done completely automatically. So no human intervention required. You can come and look later. Um, the way we're able to do it is because we know the class of parts. There are certain things we can automate if we know that class of parts. Um, and there's many different classes of parts. Impellers, molds, heat sinks, footwear, medical implants, brackets, tools, like all of these things are manufactured but are specific categories where specific design rules, specific decision templates can be easily applied. Uh, and so that's our approach, like, like attack this industry vertical by vertical, always based on the same underlying platform. Just to give a sense, most people don't understand where, like, okay, yeah, but like, why is this so expensive? Like, where does the cost come from? So typical cost comes from what's the price of the machine, what's the price of the operator, what's the price of post-processing, so yeah, a machine does something, but there's always some post-processing, pre-sales and engineering, and material and energy. That's the typical cost breakdown. With our algorithms, our approach, we can literally cu cut this 50%, both in cost and time reduction. And I des uh, describe a bit how it actually works. These are real numbers from like real customers using it. Uh, it's, a, it's really a game changer. But so like, why is this hard? It's, we need to combine planning, optimization, learning. Like, if, you, if you listen about like planning, optimization, like we're building alpha zero for like everyone knows Alpha Zero, yeah. Like we're building Alpha Zero for manufacturing. It's literally that. It's like how can we learn intuition from search through a manufacturing space? Um, that's what it's really about. But the problem is our users are experts. So our users don't just like a vague suggestion. Our users want to understand why they want to they want the model to be aware of its uncertainty. They want to ex have an explanation of why you chose that specific suggestion and want to visually see 
how, like why is this a good suggestion? And like Raphael will explain how we do it. The big problem for us is that like, we're not Google, we're not Facebook, this is not images, so we don't have a billion images to learn from. There's actually relatively little data, but the data is typically of high quality. It's an expert that provides us the data. The expert actually understands the invariances and allows us to augment the data set. Uh, it's often multimodal, can come with like a, like a reason why and not just a decision. Um, and we can actually also synthetically generate data much more easily than you can synthetically generate data for self-driving cars, for example. Um, but anyway, this was my general introduction by the CTO that doesn't write a lot of code. And now Raphael will like dive into the details of how it works. And so one of the secrets is that we use point clouds to represent geometry. How do you go in present mode? This one. Take it away. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Raphael. Uh, just as uh, Ben already said, I'm going to talk about point cloud based deep learning in uh, manufacturing. Just a, a quick question, how many of you have used uh, 3D deep learning before? Okay, great. Um, just a quick uh, introduction. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, my background is physics. Uh, I joined as a machine learning engineer at Octon for uh, uh, like one year and a half ago. And uh, these days I'm focused on using 3D deep learning to solve problems in manufacturing. And it's one of these problems that I'm going to introduce to you today in the form of answering three basic questions. One is the problem we want to solve and how geometries are very central to this problem. Uh, second, how can we use deep learning uh, on geometries? And third, uh, how did we turn our problem in manufacturing into a learning setting? Okay, what is the problem we want to solve? The problem is called the part orientation problem and um, in, in uh, metal 3D printing more specifically. In metal 3D printing, what you will do is you will deposit material uh, like a metal powder. Now you will use a laser to melt the, 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 the 3D part in an additive way. So here you can see the, the hatch lines of the lasers, like the laser path, and then the laser builds up this part. Great technology, comes with a lot of uh, advantages, but also comes with its own challenges. One of these challenges is that it generates a lot of heat. So um, a big struggle is thermal deformations. Um, not only thermal deformations, also when material grows and it merges together, you create these artifacts, shrink lines, all these problems you don't want to have in your uh, uh, eventual part. So luckily there are some solutions. For example, here you see actually the part just ripping itself apart uh, due to these thermal uh, stresses. One of the solutions is support structures. Uh, the nice thing about support structures is they can, they can actually keep the part from deforming uh, at the cost of being often a pain to remove afterwards. And uh, actually also really hard to get right uh, in, on the software side. Um, another uh, solution is to choose an optimal orientation. So an, um, an uh, experienced um, 3D printing engineers can actually look at the part just by the geometry, uh, decide on the optimal orientation to print it to reduce all the thermal stresses. One of the big drawbacks is that you need a lot of experience for this. So it takes years for an, uh, for an engineer to be experienced enough to do this. Um, so this actually creates a, or like represents a, a great case for deep learning, um, but we want to use deep learning on these geometries. So how can we de uh, apply deep learning on geometries? There are different approaches that we can use, uh, different ways to represent the 3D uh, geometry. The first and most, um, like the first one is a, a volumetric one. Uh, it's actually a 3D grid of voxels, like a, a structured grid where, uh, like it's a 3D matrix you feed to the network, where uh, when, a, when, when material is somewhere, it's a one, and material, when there's no material, it's a zero. Um, it's great because we can just extend the things we know from 2D CNNs to 3D, and we just have tr uh, three-dimensional convolutions, um, but the problem is that it's actually very inefficient because the models get huge, like a lot of parameters uh, get, 
Um, and you have all these discretization artifacts because you need to pick a certain voxel size. It needs to be like very regular. So um, another approach is the predict projected view. And this is what MVCN did. It's a, an example of one of these networks that uses multiple views of the part in different, uh, on, in, in different uh, angles and uh, uses a 2D CNN on these views to actually get a, a 3D shape descriptor from the part and do classification on this. Um, one of the drawbacks of this one and also the volumetric uh, uh, approach is that it, it's both very expensive to, to um, augment the part or like uh, change the orientation of the part and feed it again through the network. So for example, for our specific problem, we will really want to do inference on, on many different parts in many different orientations. So if you want to change the orientation of a part in a volumetric uh, representation, you need to revoxelize, or in the projected view, you need to re-render the part. Uh, one other approach is uh, using meshes. And MeshNet, uh, it's, a, it's a new network that came out uh, just uh, this year. Uh, it it, it uh, manages to exploit the, the connectivity um, of the triangles, um, but at the cost of being very sensitive to triangulation. Um, at last, you have point clouds. And what is so great about point clouds is a, very general, it's very close to sensor, raw sensor data. And specifically for our case, it's very easy to augment. If you want to rotate a, a point cloud, you just like apply a matrix multiplication and you rotate all the points. It's very easy, it's instant, and it's also canonical. You can go from all the other representations, you can go from to the point cloud. Um, one drawback is that it does not like explicitly use the connectivity information inside the mesh, but you can still try to use this afterwards if you just remember which faces you use to sample the point cloud. Okay, so we decided we want to use point clouds. How do we use deep learning on point clouds? So PointNet is the answer. Uh, it's an, uh, it's an, an, a neural network architecture uh, invented by uh, research from Stanford in 2017. And it, the ideas, or the big ideas to use, um, like the big challenge here is permutation invariant learning on orderless point sets. So there is no order in the way the point cloud is sampled. It's just random. So your input vector, there is no structure in the row. So your architecture cannot be sensitive to the order of the, the, the rows in this input vector. So what they do is they compute per point features with a multilayer perceptron. Um, and so this multilayer perceptron, it computes for every point one feature vector. And so it does it again, and it's very important to notice that there's no interaction between the points whatsoever. It's very counterintuitive because you, you would expect this uh, to be a requirement for it to do anything useful, uh, but it actually isn't, and I'll explain later on why. So uh, of course this matrix is still uh, order variant, so what they do is they actually do a, sy a symmetry operation. For example, uh, in the, the best performing one was a max pooling uh, variant. They also did average pooling, but max pooling performed better. And what you actually get is a, a global feature vector where here you see the red one. The red feature is like the maximal in its, in its column. And now you can see that if the order of the input points uh, changes, there is no change in the global feature vector. And then we have a global feature vector that describes, the, that is a, a general shape descriptor that we can use to do classification on in a fully connected way. Now I will go in a little bit more detail uh, about what kind of feature does it, yeah, does it learn exactly? Uh, because it explains a little bit how PointNet is able to do so much useful things with only per point features. So uh, here if you slim down the network, uh, and you allow it to only have six features. Uh, for example, some features it can learn is, or like uh, some mapping it can learn is to map uh, every point to its x, y, z coordinate and to its uh, negative set y, x, uh, x, y, z coordinate. And so what you then get is like the red point, it's the most extreme point in the positive x direction. And so essentially all these points are the most extreme in every of these directions. And so the global feature descriptor is nothing more than a description of the bounding box of the part. Not that useful, yeah, of course, but we shouldn't stop there. We can add another feature. Uh, and the other feature, the next feature could be a projection of the, 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 the point's coordinate on the, like the, the radius on the xy plane. And so uh, x squared plus y squared, what you get is you get uh, when you combine the, 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 max, the, the both extreme in the z direction, 
with this new feature, the pink one, the last one, you actually get a bounding sphere. And now the global feature vector can, can interpret these two geometric primitives that we fit to the object to actually deduce where there is some cylindricity to it. For example, a bottle of wine would have a bounding sphere that's smaller than its bounding box um, in volume. So the, the, the fully connected layers can deduce that it has some cylindrical feature to it. And um, so very important to notice, um, my conclusion is that these global features, all of them, they, they merely encode the existence of a point in some nonlinear partition of 3D space. Just like the bounding box or the bounding cylinder can be a much more complex partition 3D space. So that's how it works. And it's also important to note that it's per point features. So uh, how can it be improved? Uh, what are the successes of PointNet? Because it didn't stop there, it's like 2017. So um, direct aggregation of per point features, something is to say about that. Um, it makes everything permutation invariant, but the problem is that it only, just like what I said, it merely encodes whether a point exists and not what type of point exists. So for example, a type of point can be um, the top of a cone or like a point on a planar surface or the point on a convex surface. It's like the context of a point. And if you have the, the point and its context to start from, it will increase the performance. Why do we think so? If you include the face normals, it generally boosts performance. And surface normal, sorry, surface normals. And what is the surface normal? It's actually an approximation of the local neighborhood of a point in terms of a planar surface. So it actually just uh, assumes it's, a, it's, it's planar. And um, so a surface norm is a very simple description of a local neighborhood. Um, and the, the insight here is that we can just learn this type of information this context of a point from the point's local neighborhood. That's basically what all the successors of PointNet did. Um, PointNet plus plus did it, as well did it, did it, both in a different way, but it boiled down to the same principle that they tried to include, apart from the point's position, also a description of the point's local neighborhood. Okay, we have our architecture, we have our problem, how can we learn, how can we turn this problem into a learning setting? So what information does the Factor OS provide us? So the Factor OS will suggest an orientation, an optimal orientation to the user, and the user can then either agree or disagree with the orientation. If he disagrees, he will give us a custom orientation using this gimbal. Um, that's great. So now we know uh, that this custom orientation is better than our suggestions. We don't know whether this is good and the others are bad, so it's not just a classification task, one and zero. What we do is we use, um, a pairwise rank loss. To really encode the fact that we don't say that the green one is good and the red one is bad, we just say that the green one is better than the red one. Um, and so this type of rank loss actually helps our network to, perf to convert much faster and much better aligns with our initial goals to create a network where its prediction logic is actually proportional to uh, some sort of quality metric that is able to rank different orientations, just like a, an expert engineer would do it. So what you see here is you see two versions of the same network. One is trained using the classification loss, the blue one, and one is trained using the pairwise rank loss. And you can see um, here it's the, like the average rank of an expert's choice. So in front, we, we ask the expert to make his preferred orientation, and then we see how low or how high our network will rank this expert's choice. And as you can see, when it's trained with the pairwise rank loss, the orange one, it much more robustly uh, and, and it learns in a, in a much more stable manner um, what we actually intended. So how do we interpret our prediction logic? Because now it is not just, it's not anymore related to confidence, uh, but we still want to get an idea of the confidence, right? So um, luckily there was a, a guy called Yaring Gall and he wrote a blog post about what my deep model doesn't know. I really recommend the blog post. Uh, and the basic idea from the blog post is that you can just infer uh, multiple times through your model uh, with, a dropout with, a dropout uh, with a dropout layer enabled and use the variance on the outputs as a measure of confidence. And then it's only a matter to use that confidence to decide what you show to the user and what not. Because we only want to show to the user orientations where we are confident of. 
Okay, so that's it. Um, we're finished, right? We have a, we have a, we have model that can that can rank orientations just like an engineer and is uh, aware of its own confidence on it. Um, but of course, that's not enough. We need to explain to the user why we made a certain choice. We need to make the the model explainable. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a look at saliency maps for images. What, what you generally do is you look at the gradient of the rank of the loss over eliminating the, the uh, eliminating a certain pixel, like rendering a certain pixel meaningless. Um, and what you can see then is uh, on, on the classification ta task, you see that these pixels are like the most important. The network has put on the most important, or like put the most information uh, attention on these points to decide that this is a dog. So the idea is to um, use a gradient for the prediction loss over removing a point from the point cloud. But of course, this is not differentiable, so what we do is we remove a point in a differentiable way by moving it to the center. And to really understand why this is quite intuitive to do this, you need to think back about the slide where I talked about the bounding boxes and the bounding sphere. You can actually imagine why the center is so important and why it actually enables us to render a point meaningless, what we want to achieve. So we take the gradient over uh, the loss with respect to moving a point <coughs> to the origin. What we then get is we get a, a, a colored saliency map of why our model decided to orient this part in this way. And the yellow part is actually the part where the model put the most attention on. So you see the cylindrical part here at the top, it's something that you want to build straight. And then the flat part is very thin, very flat, can, can deform very easily. So you want to put this, you want to um, position this as straight as possible. Now you can also see that the whole spherical part here is of course not that important because it's spherical. No matter how you orient it, it will be it will be identical. Um, and so now we can actually give the user some insight in why we did it. But why stop there? We now have these very rich embeddings that actually describe what the orientation challenges were in, uh, uh, what the orientation challenges are in terms of 3D printing. Because we, we trained the model using this objective of acting like an engineer. And so what we do is we, we take the embeddings, we cluster them in different cluster sizes, different amount of clusters, and we, we saw certain patterns. We created this hierarchical system of motivations, motivations that engineers use to uh, explain their, um, their way of orienting a part. And the reason why we made the hierarchical is that it actually enables us to fall back to a more general explanation when we are uncertain about more detailed explanation. So specifically for this part, uh, the model is very certain about geometric, that it has something to do with geometric accuracy, and it's, more cer it's certain enough that it's something to do with cylindricity. Um, for support structures, it knows it has something to do with hard to reach support structures. So this part is hollow, there's a, a cavity here inside, and if you would place this uh, just flat, there would be support structures required inside of the part. So that's why you prevent it. It, it knows that there's some sort of compromise going on. It's, it sees this in, in, the, in the embedding, but it is not certain, for example, that it's something perpendicular. So if you put everything together, we have a, a part uh, with a colored salience map that gives uh, an idea to the end user why we chose this orientation, what we put the most attention on, and we have orientation, uh, we have motivations in words. We have an, uh, a quality metric that actually says uh, something that is uh, proportional to the quality of the part. And we have the, the multiple suggestions based on the confidence. So that's it. Are there any wait, questions? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we have like five minutes left. Okay. So when we showed this, even to the experts we interviewed, when we gathered the data set, they couldn't believe it. Like we gave parts to the system that they never saw, that the system never saw, and it got the orientation right. It showed the saliency, it ex explained it, and the expert was like, holy crap, like this thing reads my mind. This is exactly how I would have put it. So like it's, it really works. It's, it's quite amazing. So, and this is one application of point clouds. There is many, many applications of point clouds in the fact US. I'm gonna st like finish with one slide. <laughs> Everyone was able to put in their pitch. So like, uh, 
at Octon, we are actually global startups. We have offices in San Francisco, Copenhagen, uh, Ghent in Belgium, and Shanghai. And we're yeah, a, a very diverse group of, uh, of uh, engineers, especially interested in hiring uh, bright machine learning talent. So feel free to, uh, to reach out. Any questions? So the 3D printing orientation was one of the first canonical problems we, we attached, like we, we approached because it's, uh, it's notoriously difficult to solve. Um, we're applying similar methods now much more broadly. We're ex also expanding beyond 3D printing to like CNC machining, to like ro robot programming. Um, and uh, so I, I can't go into the details of these applications, but it's similar approaches where it's kind of this layering of being able to process point clouds, being able to reason about uncertainty, explain it, like that stack is very powerful and allows us to do many more things. Yeah, so we already have that in the platform today where like if your print is done, not only can you say very easily the operator at the machine can say, okay, it worked or it failed. Very often when you make a bad choice, it catastrophically fails and you can quickly see it. But we even added in the ability, if in your factory you have scanning technology, you can scan the parts and upload it to our platform and it'll just become part of the training set. Um, so it is fully closed loop. Not only closed loop with the engineers, but also closed loop with the production environment itself. We did detect bugs in our own, so there's so for example, we generated a bunch of data to, to train from using our own algorithms, for example, to generate support. And then we trained a model on it. And then the model found cases where there was a bug in our tool. So where this, the model said, ah, oh, we should, you should have had support here, but you didn't generate it. And then we, we looked and there was a bug. So it's like one example. It's yeah, but yeah, we, we can see at uh, the, the mistakes it makes at what the weaknesses are uh, currently. Yeah, it can vary, like we've used mm -hmm. 1,024 points up to 5,000. Um, if it's more complex, do you sample it? Or so we, uh, we, we typically down sample the like, parts typically of like half a million triangles or something like that. And so, mm -hmm. especially for these high level decisions, you don't need that mm -hmm. precision. So we down sample them um, to allow very rapid decision making. Because one important thing, like simulation technology has existed for a long time and people haven't extensively been using it because simulation, like typical physical FEA type simulation is notoriously slow. And yes, people have accelerated it with all kinds of tricks, but it's still something you first make all the decisions and then you validate with simulation. You don't use simulation to actually give you suggestions because it's just too slow. Um, and so. Here it's fast enough, it's millisecond scale, it's fast enough for us to generate many, like search through many alternatives and then do the simulation up front.
So it's not, yeah, it's invariances. It's not very, yeah. Like for example, an expert might say, ah, oh, the, the, the way I would orient this part, I would orient it the same irrespective, irrespective of if it would be like, like taller or smaller. Or if, it, if, if you would skew it slide sideways, it would still be this. And so those are simple examples the same way you could like encode certain like invariances in image transforms. Um, the other thing was about the, uh, if you compare the uh, point cloud net with uh, 3D CNN, uh, and one reason you, you that the 3D CNN doesn't actually uh, work so well is that it's not very efficient. Uh, what, is the, what is the comparison between the size of the model that you end up using with an equivalent 3D CNN? What's the number of parameters? What's the par how much smaller is it? How many parameters can you say about it? Yeah, I think at a, like a, a point of basic between the model net, uh, it can go as low as a few 100,000 parameters. And I actually don't know the number for 3D CNNs, but I know the number for multi-view CNNs. It can, it's, it's way above 1 million, so it's like upwards of 10 times the size. And typically with 3D, like, so, so the, the voxel-based like 3D CNNs need relatively aggressive regularization to get any proper generalization um, because the parameter space is actually so large and it's hard to generate a lot of data in that voxel space. And so that's, that's why they've typically not been used a lot. Or maybe like, yeah, in some medical applications where people work on like CT type data, which are like gigabytes in size, um, but those, like there, the, there it's typically very slow. Yeah, so the bounding box uh, partitions the space, as in like everything inside the bounding box or outside the bounding box. The bounding cylinder partitions the space in a different way, but it doesn't have to stop with a cylinder. cylinder. It can be a cone, it can be any kind of geometric shape that mm -hmm. just slices through the 3D yeah. space. And the partition comes from the max pooling, so the max pooling says like what's inside and what's outside. Yeah. And then the neural network is the one that Learns. projects your points into like some manifold or some uh. Yeah, so the network will learn multiple cones in different orientations. Just like the bounding cylinder, it will learn it in different orientations. Yes. Um, but was that similar to any of the uh, ones um, that you have in the thing? I mean, how, so what's the range of the kind of thing that you see with your... Uh, so we saw parts before that have... Oh. We saw parts before that had flat sides, and we saw parts before that had cylindrical sections, and but we never saw anything that was close to this. Never something flat under an angle with something cylindrical, but like we saw these sub features. Um, and that like it's, if you look at the explanation, like it's as if the network learns these sub features, like it knows how to deal with certain sub features. And if it sees multiple of these sub features get combined, it's able to say, oh yeah, I need to make a trade off between these sub features. Um, so that's how, like it's, it, that's what we see a lot. Like it, it's really able to have approaches for certain geometrical things that, that often arise. And so what, what we also, like you see, like the part is identified as industrial. So we also, the network is able to classify, okay, this is an industrial part. This is a dental stent, it's a crown. So it's like this part classification is also part of the whole, of the whole stack, just all based on the same descriptor that comes out.